it's Kristen with Collision Hub, and welcome to part two of our series with iCar on what's new. Um, and I thought hands-on should be its own standalone segment, right? Um, so there's a lot of shops that are that are starting to experience hands-on. There are some shops wondering, do I do hands-on? How does it work? Um, so guys, let's talk about the new hands-on, I don't want to say new, but the hands-on training that iCar now has. Sure. Yeah, this is something that the industry's been asking us for more of for quite some time. And, uh, and so we started putting real effort into it over the last couple of years. And you've seen uh, from us, we've put out uh, the rivet and rivet bonding course, the plastic repair course, uh, MIG brazing, and then squeeze type resistance spot welding. Those are four courses that are available right now and they have been for a little while now. Um, and they're, they're hands-on skills development courses. And so what does that mean? Uh, that means that we're gonna come to your facility and we're gonna teach your staff on your equipment. You're not coming to some other location and learning on some other piece of equipment that may not be transferable when you get back. Um, we're gonna teach you on, on, your, on your equipment. And so we've gotten really good feedback from that and the demand has been you know, increasing as, as people get you know, acclimated to the idea. And uh, as part of the overall curriculum build, we, we made an effort to build more of these hands-on courses. All right. Now, there's a couple of courses that are required for Gold Class. So in the first episode, we talked about all the changes that have happened in Gold Class sure. recently. But now, two of these hands-on are required for you to be able to say, my facility is Gold Class. Which two are those? Squeeze type resistant spot welding and MIG brazing. And the primary driver for that is that those are the most relevant, if you will, from a structural standpoint across the different OEs right now. We're seeing more and more of those repairs, you know, those procedures being called out. And, uh, and we wanted to make sure that those are things that the shops are able to do. Now, you mentioned a few of the courses, the aluminum, uh, I'm sorry, the rivet bonding um, and plastic repair. But there's some other hands-on courses that are out there too, right? There's, Absolutely. What, Absolutely. Are, what are some of those? So we've, uh, we've put together a, a couple of different dent panels. So we've got a steel dent panel uh, prop for a steel dent removal one and two. So in one, you're gonna deal with a relatively minor dent in this panel. Uh, and, the, and, and working that out and, and getting all the way through to the point where it's ready for paint. Um, and the second one, the, the, the dents are more su substantial, what you have to deal with. You know, so you're gonna start seeing things across body lines or across uh, at, at the corner or at the edge where it's gonna be more difficult to work out that, that issue. Um, we've also put together an aluminum version. Uh, so you're gonna, same, same style panel, except that the, the substrate is aluminum. And so now you're working through how, how those procedures are different um, when we're working on that material. Um, let's see, we've got measuring, anchoring, and pulling, which we actually, uh, we, we did some of that last here with, yeah. with you last year. Um, so that measuring, anchoring, and pulling strategies course is a hands-on course. You're gonna be around a vehicle on a, on a frame rack with a measure, 3D measuring system. And you're gonna go through taking some live measurements and then coming up with a repair plan based on that. And so every time you run that class, it's gonna be different yeah. because you're not gonna do it on the same vehicle each time. And uh, we've also got a number of printouts of actual vehicles and the, and the measurements that came from those vehicles that you then work through. And it's really about trying to get the technicians to, re to really interpret and rely on the numbers and, uh, and not just, you know, is it in the green, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. And try and get away from that mentality that, you know, it's in the spec, so it must be good. Well, we're finding a lot. We, you know, Larry and I go out and work with a lot of shops, and this is a department, structural, measuring, pulling, is, I want to say, one of the lowest skills that we have. You know, I used to think that our welding skill levels were kind of low in the industry. This one needs a lot of work. I think a lot of shop owners assume that the technicians out in their bays know how to do that and know how to use that equipment, but we regularly find in, in, what I would say nicer, higher shops, you know, that are dealerships or whatever, sh technicians that don't even know how to set up the measuring equipment appropriately. Um, so they're not even getting accurate measurements. They don't know how to, you know, for like Carl Leonard to zero out and do some other things. Um, and then that don't understand anchoring and how that affects pulling. I mean, it's just like, I'm going to grab over here and rip for a couple hours and you're like, yeah. whoa, <laughs> let's, let's rethink that, right? <laughs> so I think this is a class that I would, you know, I, I can't go everywhere and I won't let Larry go everywhere, <laughs> right? Um, but this is a class every shop should just take the benefit and, and haul somebody in. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. I mean, ICAR's had three dimensional measuring class available for you know since, since the history of ICAR, right? Mm -hmm. um, Carline or Chief, they've all had their three dimensional measuring classes on again how to use your equipment, how you know what length, width, height, you know datum. We've, we've all those common terms, but there's never been before, to my knowledge, anyways, and, and you know kind of that strategies approach of okay, let's look at this vehicle and what are you thinking when you're walking up to it, and what's that whole thought process, and there's never been a good way, I don't think, for especially for a young technician, to kind of learn those approaches other than by trial and error. And I don't want that trial and error on my vehicle. vehicle. Yeah. So if we if we can pair up that experienced technician with maybe a younger technician in this class and have those conversations and start that conversation around. And, and we saw it here when we did the when we did the class here. Um, we had we had one uh, one individual that really kind of elevated and kind of worked hand in hand with the instructor and it kind of. And I think that gives you that that kind of that mentorship, and rather than just, well, I don't really know Josh, and how can I, how do I, can I trust Josh? Versus no. if, no. if yeah. right, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> versus if we're peers in the shop. Now I think there's a, there's a little bit more of a comfort level there, and I think that that's one of the, the engaging parts of what this class is having those conversations. Like, okay, what if we anchor here, and what if we put the towers here? What's that going to do? Um, again, rather than just trying it, now we can have the conversation. Well, you know what? If we do it at that angle. Here's what might be the result of that. And if we don't block it here, if we don't anchor it here, I think that that's, that's one of the things that's really cool about that particular class is it's, again, it's real world. It's going to be different for every class, just like every closure repair is going to be different. I think it really mimics that, uh, the, the reality of what we're working on. Right. Well, I don't want to say unfortunately, but if I look at the classes that you guys have offered in the hands-on, Unfortunately, <laughs> the education around those particular operations with the equipment the shop owns has usually rested with the jobber that sold them the equipment. Right. And I got some really good jobbers in yeah. North America, and I got some really bad jobbers in North America that, that don't understand the equipment, that don't know how the repair process works, that can't set up a welder or can't do any of these other things. So being able to have a third party come in that's not tied to profit margin of you wanting to buy another one of that product in a couple of years um, and work with your technicians is exactly what every collision repair facility needs. Um, because sometimes I come in and go, why have we got an equipment problem? Sure. Right. <laughs> and it's hard for the guy that sold me that equipment to, to, to tell me that. So, I mean, everything down to, I mean, even now you've got a a buffing and a polishing so you're kind of working with preppers even right, right. Yep. yeah yeah and the intent with that class is you, you you end up with you start off with a prop that has defects built into it you know during the the assembly process of the prop if you will and uh, and those defects at least to the you know from my perspective to the untrained eye or the inexperienced eye some of those things look like I got to start over mm -hmm. you know they don't look like something that you should be able to resolve and and it's about kind of back to the strategies class, it's about you know pairing up the experienced uh, refinish tech with maybe the inexperienced uh, refinish tech or uh, prepper, if you will, and, and, and allowing them to establish that relationship, uh, work with the instructor, and, and do we expect that you're gonna learn, you know, everybody's gonna learn everything brand new in those classes? No, it's about, it's about picking up things that, you know, tips and tricks that maybe you didn't have in your toolbox before. You know, and and finding that there's another way to resolve it that maybe you that you just hadn't landed on yet. You know, mm -hmm. because again, where you know where are most of the technicians getting their their knowledge these days? That's if right. it's not from an ICAR classroom, it's it's a tribal thing. Yeah. It's they learn from so and so, <laughs> right? Yeah, or Facebook or YouTube, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so they they learn from you know the the person that you know was working in that position before them. You know, and so sometimes that library that you're learning from can be limited. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Right. I mean, Jason and I both, you know, and, and Kristen, we've all been technicians at one point in time or another, and we all learn from other techs, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Right. But right. having more tools in the library is a good thing. And I'll go back to your, your job or statement as well. Again, that their 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 role in the industry is to is to sell equipment, right? That's 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 their role. And especially when you start talking about new technologies coming again, back to MIG brazing and, and, and riveting as well. Um, when they're getting that equipment, they're not trained on it that well. They don't know how to use it. But uh, again, MIG Brazen, we, we bring the ICAR instructors into you know, a classroom environment and, and teach them how to do it, make sure that they can do it with MIG Brazen. So when they go to your shop, um, that they've got that skill and that they can communicate that. And, it, it, and it's, it's a great way, I think, for, again, the, the jobber to focus on what they can do and get out and make sure that the shops are equipped with the proper equipment. And then ICAR is a training organization. Um, we can come in there and again work with those organizations to make sure that 
our instructors know how to use that equipment, whether it's you know Pro Spot, Carline, or you know Chief Spinizzi, whomever that equipment is coming from. They understand how to use that equipment, how to set that equipment up, and we can we can spend a lot of time and and, and focus on that equipment and and get them educated to what the point that they need to be. And the other thing that we've done is, um, I think, uh, with, with regard to the rivet bonding course, for example, um, we've, we've even partnered up with, with ProSpot, where in a lot of situations where you buy a ProSpot rivet gun, the iCar training comes with it. Um, so we've got a process for that to make sure that, you know, shop A has you know, purchased this rivet gun. Uh, we can go into the shop and train their technicians on how to use that equipment to make sure that we're not breaking dies when we're removing or installing rivets. Um, and again, hopefully, ultimately, shaving, you know, saving the shop some, some money um, on, on replacement equipment, make sure the, the technician understands how to maintain that equipment properly. And again, it's all, it's all about complete safe and quality repairs. And as more vehicle makers require new technology, we've got an avenue now to kind of get that new technology to you, as well as um, whether, again, it's that entry level technician or you know, it's the sanding and buffing and new techniques or new, new, uh, new tools that might be out there. It's just a great way to get hands on it. The, the thing I really like about the hands-on skills development courses is a lot of, as close repair technicians, we work with our hands. A lot mm -hmm. of us are kinesthetic learners. Right. And so again, whether it's that online theory is great and the classroom where I can have the conversation with the instructor is great, but I want to get my hands dirty. I want to get my right. hands on the equipment and try it out and learn from trial and error. And again, doing that on practice parts and coupons rather than you know, someone's vehicle that's in our shop, I think it's just really important. I think, I think that's a good point, and I think it goes back to, like we talked about in the last episode, about blended learning. Um, the, there's, there's this, I think, kind of a default reaction when you hear about online training, that, you know, online training's not great, we're all hands-on learners. Well, when you're learning theory, there's no hands-on component to that, right? right? We're not going to do a hands-on class about putting on safety glasses. Or, or putting on the right gloves or, or something like that. You know, I mean, maybe we should, but, but likely that, that won't go over all that well, right? And, and so the purpose of online, if done well in a blended approach, is to get those things out of the way so that the instructor can go focus on the hands-on activities. So a blended learning approach isn't about taking everything out of the classroom. It's about freeing the instructor in the classroom up to do the things that are hands-on related. And, and, and actually allow for that to happen with, uh, with more frequency. It, another thing I, I think is great with the hands-on skills development courses, and even the welding training certification program as well, is it, it, versus a, a class of 20, you've got a question and like, how likely are you to go like, um, I got a, I've got a question over here. You, you, you oftentimes embarrassed, you don't want to ask a question when it's the three of us with or an instructor. Your or your competitor, you. sure. Yeah. Right. Um, but if it's the three of us with an instructor in there, now I'm more comfortable asking questions and getting clarification on things that like, in the past, maybe I would have said, like, you know what, I don't understand exactly what they're saying, but I'm not going to mention it. Now we can go, like, hey, I got, a, you know, I, got a, I got a dumb question. How do we do this? And now we can have that conversation right. and work through that. I think that's a, a, a huge part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Building that team environment. So a couple of, of things I've heard from people that I like a lot is um, <laughs> you have a... Um, everyone thinks their shop's the best, right? As an owner, we fix cars the best. I have the best technicians. We have the best CSI. I mean, I've never walked into the shop and they go, you know what, Kristen, we really suck in these three areas. And or that's, we're you just know, okay. Cool. Yeah, we're okay. Perfect. Yeah, everyone's the best. Um, and we'll walk through a shop and 10 minutes later, we're like, we got to go. We got to get out of here. So <laughs> one of the things I like is that, one, I'm hearing um, back from shops that the iCar people are coming in for hands-on training and they're discovering that their facility wasn't, what they thought it was. Maybe there were power issues or sure. some equipment issues or something. Um, so that's good. And then I've had some owners that are telling me that they're not, they're discovering that their technicians aren't quite what they thought they were either. Um, so by standing and watching that training take place, they're learning where maybe some of their attention needs to go. Okay, I need to, these three guys are good. I thought these two guys were good, but maybe I need to spend a little extra time working with them on their procedures maybe look at their cars a little bit more closely and that really elevates that bar for the safe quality repair absolutely yeah. absolutely and you know um jason was talking a little bit about you know things like with you know rivet rivet bonding and 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 learning uh with the instructor so that you're not uh you know hurting a die i, I don't know about you guys but uh, set aside complete safe quality repairs for a moment the whole process of just learning by trial and error is generally pretty pricey you know, yeah. and and so you yeah, know, I've got to pay for that equipment. So right, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And so having somebody come in that can show you the right way to use it, especially if it's your first time using it, 
um, it's it's a safer space, you know, to, to go through that learning curve. Yeah, because techs crack me up, right? So if I borrow your screwdriver and screw it up, you're going to threaten to kill me. We may have a fist fight at some point, either in the shop or in the parking lot. That's my tool. But if they'll break a $20,000 welder, wield it in the front office and go, I don't know what you're mad about. <laughs> it's not my, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like, <laughs> right. yeah. when are you going to get that fixed? I got another car coming in next week. And you just kind of want to, you want to crush them. So how shops go about setting this up for them? And is there a limit? Is my shop maybe too small for an iCar hands-on? Would I not be eligible with just a couple of us here? No, absolutely. It's it, it's it's available to everybody, and uh, you go through the process. Uh, you know, as the new systems come online, you'll be able to go through that process online and register for the hands-on class that you're interested in, and set that up. And the you know the, there's a scheduling team that will be involved in, in setting up you know a, a a time that works you know for both the instructor and for your shop, um, and and it's 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 fairly custom the the approach to get all of that coordinated. You know, because yeah. it's not about, you know, can you come next Tuesday night to the to local, uh, you know, to the local classroom that we're using. It's about when can we come to your facility and use your equipment to train your staff. Right, you're going to have to shut down. Right, you're absolutely. Gonna, gonna have to and, working. you know, one of the classes that we didn't get a chance to talk about is, uh, is door skin and hem flange installation. And uh, I wanted to bring that one up as well just because it's another one that's available. Um, and, and I think what's good about that class, again, it sounds maybe a little bit on the basic side but it, it incorporates a number of different uh, procedures, if you will. So uh, if you go through that class, one of the things you're gonna get to do, uh, hopefully your facility has like most, uh, you got a metal bin out back, and in that metal bin, you've probably got a door that wasn't you know, able to be reused. So we're gonna take that door, and as a group, we're gonna take that door apart. Uh, we're gonna, you know, and, and show some of the complexity of dealing with the harness and dealing with the different linkages inside and, and going through that process, how to get the window out without breaking it, it, it assuming that it's still intact and, and, and those types of things. So that you get some of that, again, in a safe space, you get to go through that process of, uh, of, of going through and, and taking that all apart. Um, and then we've got a prop that has a reusable frame like a door and uh, in replacement skins. And so you're then gonna get to deal with corrosion protection and, and flange prep and the adhesives and, uh, and then rolling the hem flange around that, that frame. Um, and so there's some hands-on pieces where, again, even if you're an experienced tech, I think there's gonna be little takeaways that, you know, tips or tricks again, that, that you hadn't picked up on before, whether you're learning from the other person in the class with you or you're learning from the instructor or both. I, I would encourage every shop not to assume that anything is too simple. Um, you know, I think I kind of made some of those mistakes a couple of years ago with some of the stuff we started teaching. In fact, one of the first Repair University episodes out of the gate was MIG brazing. And I realized, wow, I, I got to back that back. We weren't ready for that. Let's go down about a three, four or four more levels Let's and then we'll come right. up. Um, so, so I would, as a shop owner, don't assume that anything is too basic for your people. And at least as that comes through, that helps you level set where you are. So at least you know where you need to go. And I, and I think an important component of that is it doesn't, none of this is meant to sound like, you know, we've got, you know, an industry full of technicians that need to learn the basics. Right. That's, that's not the message at all. It's that almost everyone who's performing a job, and it doesn't matter what that job is. I mean, we all spend time working in Microsoft Office uh, in Word. Mm -hmm. How often do you learn some new trick right. in Microsoft Word, regardless of how long you've been doing it? You know, there's... There's new things that you can learn, new tips and tricks or shortcuts or whatever that are appropriate for, for everyday use that you're not necessarily aware of. Yeah, and I, that's the intent. Yeah, but helping it's still, to raise the game. That, going back to the basics is, uh, be, if we go back to the tribal learning kind of mentality, right. most of our technicians today haven't had formal learning. They've learned from the guy that was in the shop yeah. That was the 30 year veteran, which means he learned in the 70s or the 80s. And, you know, and we, and we keep, or the 50s, and we keep, I don't want to say we keep progressing bad habits. And you can see that all day long on, on social media. When you log on, you watch a guy who's very proud of the job he did. And some of us look at it and go, you know, 1985 called. They want their technique and equipment back, right? right. So, but, but so I think we've made assumptions. The technicians, God, we're driven by ego. We are. Yeah. That we know what we don't know. Right. Um, right. So I, I usually, every time I go in and work with a shop owner, I go, don't assume, you know, you're going to tell me how great your techs are. And I'm going to sit here and go, uh-huh. And you're going to tell me you don't have any comebacks. And I'm going to go, uh-huh. And then you're going to tell me how well loved you are in the community and how you're the best shop in town. And you're always having to fix everybody else's problems. And I'm going to go, uh-huh. 
And I'm not going to tell you that yesterday when I was at your competitor, he's like, and we're the best shop in yeah, town, and we have absolutely. to fix everybody else's problems and whatever. Um, so let's just level set. Maybe you're right, right? Maybe you're absolutely right, and your techs know, you know all of this, and we need to be here, but let's just get a level there. I think overall, we, we've just got to get better as an industry. And you know, to your point, of, you know, it, but things have changed so dramatically. I think for many years, um, you know, the traditional steel unibody vehicle hadn't changed a whole lot, right? And we added airbags, we added anti-lock brakes, we added, you know, electronic stability control. And then this whole, you know, generation of, of new steels came out and it's no longer just a steel vehicle anymore. And, and I think we really need to take a look at ourselves and, 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 and be aware that things do change and we do need to keep pace with technology. We need to invest in new tools and equipment. We need to invest in training, and we just have to get better, I think, as, a, as, a, as an industry and be okay with yeah. not knowing everything. Well, something as simple as even just like a steel, a steel door, really. I mean, that Malibu door fixes completely different than the Camry door because Camry, you know, Toyota does special things with their steels that GM doesn't do, and GM does different sure. special things. So just even as something as I'm going to fix a steel dent isn't quite as, as common <laughs> as it, as it yeah. used to be. Um, now, one of the questions I get asked a lot about the hands-on training from ICAR is, okay, Kristen, come on. Am I really going to get an ICAR instructor that knows what they're doing? Or am I going to get an adjuster that was, you know, teaching one of the classes last month? But you guys have made some significant, I don't want to say, criteria and investment in ensuring that Absolutely. that's not your average ICAR instructor, right? Sure. Yeah, that, that selection process, the onboarding process, the training process to be able to go out and be whether it's welding training certification uh, instructor or it's the hands-on skills development uh, instructor, the, the process for that is, is pretty labor intensive yeah. um, and, and quite daunting if, yeah. if you're not prepared for that. Uh, and you're not gonna make it through. Um, we're, th it's not like everyone who shows up and says, hey, I'd like to teach this. Right. They, they get a kit and, and off you go. You know, there's a, there's a process and, and that process is pretty regimented. And because and, we wanna make sure that they've got what it takes to be able to deliver that class and have it deliver value. Doesn't mean that they, they don't have value if they don't get selected for a particular class. It just means maybe that class wasn't a good fit for thanks, them. Thanks for that, Jeff. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So don't, so don't lose any sleep tonight, Kristen, because you didn't get it. I didn't but, get it. Right. I, the, the thought of having someone like a Steve Marks judge my welding, I wouldn't even show up. Yeah, I would right. just be like, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'll, I'll pass on that as well. Yeah, exactly. yeah we brought in what? 30 instructors or so uh, to the tech center yeah. for five days of training. Um, put them in groups, they went through everything, hands on, just, I mean, there's a lot of noise coming out of the shop that week, both shops, not, you know, the, the production shop and the, and the contract training shop. Um, and we, you know, it was, it was a hands on, immersive experience. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for five days. Yeah, yeah. And, you and, know. and so we're, and we're looking to do things like that. And those individuals then go out and train in their communities, make sure that those ICAR instructors are, 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 are capable of doing it. And, and, and here's one thing that I would, I would plead with, uh, with the industry on it. If, if you've always thought about becoming an ICAR instructor, but you didn't really, you didn't want to be the one that stood up in front of class for four hours and lectured, but, but now that we've got these hands on, we're looking for good quality ICAR instructors. And I'm sure our friend Lori back in Appleton would be happy to, uh, to, yeah. to, to, to have some more conversation. What we're looking for, you know, those, those, those young technicians that are go-getters that have these skills that, um, maybe they're part of a, a network that they've gone through aluminum welding or riveting or make brazing and, and they will share their skills with any. So we're definitely looking for, you know, that those those high quality instructors. Yeah. So, um, you don't have to carry a room for four hours. You just have to do what you, I mean, so if you think of the the Mike's who was here for our structural yeah. class, uh, right. uh, Kijan out of, out of Baltimore, Carmine out of, you know, Mid-Island, those techs that are, I, you know, they wouldn't dream of teaching a three hour class right. on refinishing. Um, with a test, but this is their bread and butter and they right. do it really, really well every day in the shops they're in. And if we can turn those guys into mirrors for the industry and, and then it's all about the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, um, back to your point about, uh, you know, making sure it's the right person that's, that's doing this work. When, when the, the activity that Jason described where we had, you know, 30 plus instructors in at the tech center for, uh, for a week, um, not everyone got selected to be able to teach every one of those classes. Right. They all went through all of them. But part of that was an evaluation process to figure out whether they were the right person to be teaching that class in the long run. And not everyone got approved for everything, yep. you know, as you'd expect, right. you know. And, and the folks that didn't, didn't leave their, you know, um, down on themselves, they, 
they knew they weren't the right person either after they'd gone through the process. Yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong and, with that. And that's right. Exactly. Know what you can't do. Right. Um, same for every technician. I should know what I can't do. I yeah, absolutely. Am, I don't give me aluminum. Sure. I am horrible. That's yeah. Larry's thing. Right. There's an aluminum car, Larry. Yeah. Go have fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> so oh, you just know know your limits and and know that. Um, but the hands-on things are just a phenomenal opportunity and it's a chance to learn and train in your shop on your equipment with just your people no yeah. competitors no outside influence on mm -hmm. on your people changing what they may think or do um, a long time needed yeah. Yeah. opportunity now we just got to get shops to know it's there yeah. and sure. take advantage of it so really important question when larry's doing the aluminum work is he tucking tucking the chain out of the way or well uh, we, he, we do, do make him remove it because okay. of cross contamination, corrosion issues. We don't want to touch. We, we can't right. have touching. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. So just, he does. Just curious. There's a lock box. He has to lock up all that in. Got um, it. Okay. Yeah. And we did also come up with like a paracord way for him to tie his wallet to his, you know, so that would be a little safer. Right. He's not That's happy. Good about backup that. plan. Yeah. But he's not happy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, so, he's, it throws him off balance. It does. It's not as heavy. Yeah. Well, he also can't use it as a wrap it around this. I mean, that's another story. We'll, right, right. we'll get to no, that. One. That's another episode. <laughs> yeah, but no, uh, kudos on the on the hands on. I think it's great. Um, it's one of the things we encourage shops to do. You don't know what you don't know, and you don't know where your people are until you level set them. And iCar's offering great ways to do that, plus get some great in shop training. Um, and increase your quality control because I think now it's elevated. Everyone in the shop knows what right looks like and what good is. And yeah. so then we don't have to have that tech in the corner that we all laugh at and go, what is he doing over there? We, <laughs> we, all, we all know. So, well, that's part two of our What's New with iCar on the hands-on. Uh, we're in part three. We're going to focus on RTS. I mean, so I say it in every day and in every OEM show. I start every day with the RTS portal from iCar. It's my go-to source of information. Um, Jason's going to update us on what all's happened with iCar since it's launched. Are we on year two now? Oh, no, we're, we're, we're beyond that. that. Yeah, we're coming up on five. For that five? Oh, five years, June 30th, like the launch of the, web, of the website. Yeah, I mean. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to get some updates on where we are with that. What's new on the portal and maybe some tips and tricks on how to use it, as well as how you can make iCar your OEM link pin. So we'll see you on episode three of What's New with iCar. Thank <laughs> you.